The 20th century was a time of incredible change. Look unspeakable horrors, and amazing leaps of scientific discovery. It was a century where we showed what we are truly capable of. The pure imagination of artistic expression, the insidious desire to harm and oppress, the will to fight against the weight of a prevailing status quo, the drive to understand the universe and to improve our lives. A century made by leaders and revolutionaries, scientists and thinkers, artists, Wait till you see Muhammad. icons, I have a dream. heroes, we want freedom. and villains. We will count down through the 101 figures of the 20th century who have shaped the world in which we live and whose stories form the tapestry of our history. On this episode. I think anybody who is as dedicated to bare knuckled rail politics is bound to create a lot of animosity. No one ever doubted his brilliance, but the people putting up the money very much doubted that he understood what the public wanted. She expressed something that many women said they'd been feeling but they couldn't quite put their finger on. Barbie, you're beautiful, you make me feel my Barbie doll is really real. Barbie, a global phenomenon that dominated the toy market in the second half of the 20th century. Her creation owed to one woman. Ruth Handler founded toy company Mattel with her husband in 1945. But the first major turning point for the company was Handler's most well-known creation, the Barbie doll. It was years in the making, the predominantly male executives at Mattel resisting the idea of a grown-up doll for children. But Handler persevered, sure of her vision. It's, it's not just being a visionary, and it's not just having good tactics and good strategy. You have to have will. And she had the will to see it through and to create what, to me, is one of the most important cultural icons uh, in the world. Barbie was revealed to the world at the American Toy Fair in New York in 1959, wearing a zebra print one-piece bathing suit and high heels with a range of outfits that could be purchased separately. In the first year of release, 350,000 dolls were sold. But not everyone loved Barbie. The doll has been criticized for creating an unrealistic body image for young children, with one academic calculating that a woman would have a one in 100,000 chance of having Barbie's proportions. Despite this, Barbie and her boyfriend Ken are the best-selling toys in history. Today, over one billion dolls have been sold in 150 countries. I thought the Barbie doll would always be successful. I thought it would be a great success. It's the degree of success and the length of time that is amazing. While Handler eventually moved on from Barbie and Mattel, she was witness to many of the versions of Barbie throughout the years as the doll constantly changed with the times, reflecting the shifting attitudes and priorities of her society. Looking back through Barbie's lifetime is a looking glass on trends of American culture. She was an astronaut, she was a doctor, she could do anything. And that's, it's a big part of being Barbie, is Barbie can do anything. And it's a wonderful mantra. Hopefully she'll go on forever reflecting society as it changes forever. The longest running fascist dictatorship of the 20th century. He gained control of his country in a violent civil war that would lead to decades of oppression. Francisco Franco was an unlikely military leader. 
rising through the ranks from infantry to major general, despite reports of being a bad military strategist. He was ruthless and quick to quell any dissent against him or threats to his power. Although he had a, a pot belly and a rather squeaky voice, when one legionnaire sort of imitated his voice, he just took out his pistol and shot him dead. Franco was also a brilliant political manipulator, taking part in the right-wing Spanish nationalist uprising in 1936. He positioned himself within their ranks until he could seize control. Franco's coup led to a particularly bloody civil war that would last until 1939. When he emerged victorious, he ordered tens of thousands of executions. General Franco has arrived on very special business, and it is with dictator-like tread that the new head of the state reviews his guard of honor. Franco revealed his mastery of political maneuvering again during World War II, managing to avoid direct conflict with any country. He knew that with the war about to break out in Europe as a whole, uh, the one thing he had to do was to stay out of it. But at the same time, he owed Hitler a huge amount. In his bid for control of Spain during the Civil War, Franco had accepted help from Italy and Germany. But in 1940, when Hitler asked for Franco to join his war efforts, he stalled. He allowed German submarines to refuel in his ports, but would not send his troops beyond Spain's borders. He soon saw uh, that the war had started to go in the other direction, and particularly with Stalingrad, Alamein, it was quite clear that in the long term the Germans were going to lose. So from that point of view, Franco was no longer going to allow the Germans to start uh, using um, Spanish ports for their submarines and so forth. As the war shifted in the Allies' favor, so too did Franco's allegiance. Courting Western countries by allowing free French forces to cross from France through Spain to resistance bases in North Africa. Although he didn't establish uh, warm relations at all with the Allies, uh, he had managed to extricate himself enough to make sure that he would not be overthrown or his regime would not be overthrown when the Allies finally won in 1945. Long after the Axis fell at the end of World War II, Franco continued to rule Spain. The Cold War even made allies of Spain and the United States. President Eisenhower visited Spain in 1953 to sign the Pact of Madrid, entering into a trade and military alliance. While Franco's politics did soften in later years, his was a long and oppressive reign. One has to remember, it was the longest lasting of all of the so-called fascist uh, Nazi dictatorships uh, which had started in the uh, 1920s and 1930s. A political chameleon, Franco remains an anomaly in the battle lines of World War II. A reminder that the allegiances of the 20th century were sometimes formed on convenience more than morality. An athlete whose talent and drive would make her a darling of the Olympic Games. She was a teenager from communist Romania who would redefine her sport. But the girl the crowd has taken to its heart is a 14-year-old nymphet from Romania, Nadia Comaneci. She's graceful, elfin and absolutely fearless. Nadia Comaneci catapulted into the spotlight at the 1976 Montreal Olympics when she became the first gymnast in history to score a perfect 10. An achievement so unprecedented, the scoreboards were not able to display it. Amiga were responsible for the timing of the gymnastics events and they actually asked the organisers if they should have three digits or four digits and they actually um, were told, no, it's impossible, no one is going to score a perfect 10. And then, of course, they were proved wrong. When Nadia scored the perfect 10, up on the um, board, it came up as 1.00. Her performance was founded in a rigorous training schedule back in Romania. On the day, it was flawless and seemingly effortless. No woman gymnast in the history of the Olympics has matched the achievement of this 14-year-old Romanian champion. She's achieved gymnastic perfection on three occasions during the past two days and is almost certainly on her way to more outstanding success before the end of the week. 
she would go on to score a perfect 10 a total of seven times at the Montreal Games. For years after her Olympic success, Komenich disappeared back into Romania, her life veiled by the secrecy of the country's communist regime. Then, in 1989, she arrived suddenly in New York, defecting to the US. Her arrival caused a media frenzy. No one forgot who Nadia Comaneci was. Um, she's really in the minds and hearts of, of not just people in, in America, but I think all around the world. No one forgets that perfect 10 moment. It would be over five years before she would go back to Romania. When she finally returned with her husband, American gymnast Bart Connor, a throng of fans and media were there to greet her. Years had passed since her Olympics glory, but she still captivated the public. They remembered that small yet determined teenager whose immense talent challenged all notions of what was possible. And I think she inspired all athletes and, and really people around the world that you can achieve anything you set your mind to. And she always said, I wasn't the most talented, but I was the most focused. And she worked very hard and she proved that, that you can achieve those perfect moments. At five years old, he was leading a country. At 23, he would be forced to flee his homeland. The Dalai Lama is considered by Tibetan Buddhists to be the personification of their god of compassion. For the 14th Dalai Lama, this notion was tested more than ever before. 35,000 Chinese troops arrived in Tibet in 1950, followed by the bureaucrats who sent them. In 1959, following a failed revolt against the occupation, the Dalai Lama was forced into exile, fleeing on foot across the Himalayas to India. Smiling and perfectly composed, the young god king showed no signs of his ordeal, though he'd just completed perhaps the most exhausting journey in the world. In the decades since his exile, the Dalai Lama has traveled to more than 60 countries. He has met with world leaders, and made countless speeches and appearances at events, always acting as advocate for his countrymen, whether they are in exile or in Tibet, reminding the world of his forced displacement and the ongoing occupation of his country. The Dalai Lama is perhaps the, the most uh, significant leader I've ever met, and he is someone who I think uh, symbolizes the uh, continuing importance of, of nonviolent movements for justice and rights. Our strength is truth and logic, reason, and human understanding, not weapon. But if you use these reasons and human understand with more patience and determination, then things can change. His tireless advocacy earned him the Nobel Peace Prize in 1989. Yet he has been criticized by those who want to see a more active fight against the occupation of Tibet. Since fleeing Tibet, the Dalai Lama has become a presence in both the political world and popular culture. He may have been awarded the Nobel Prize, but he also guest edited French Vogue and was used in an advertising campaign for Apple computers. So I think that his role as a person who has been born into this leadership role, but has grown as a leader because of his vision. I do feel I'm a fortunate uh, because the very purpose of human life is a serving other and helping other. That's, I think, the purpose of our life. When I think of the great world leaders, uh, Gandhi, King and uh, Nelson Mandela, it's their vision. It's the fact that they are able to see beyond the immediate struggle and see the connection with things that are going on in the world. While the Dalai Lama may not have chosen to leave Tibet, he has made the most of his circumstances. Giving his culture and his religion a chance to survive and even flourish out of the most dire of circumstances.
She was the highest selling female pop artist of the 20th century. A unique and provocative performer who constantly reinvented herself. Madonna exploded onto the charts in 1983 with her self-titled album and the single Holiday, her first song to make it into the Billboard Hot 100. The United States had always had a, a rich underground of dance records back to the uh, soul music era, records that were hits in discotheques that didn't get played on the radio, and as a result, they have a parallel existence and, and every so often one of those dance records would pop out of the clubs and get on the charts and Holiday was one of those. Madonna's music drew on the distinctive sounds of soul music, 60s girl groups, dance music and R&B. Madonna took influences from a variety of places. A huge influence for her was African-American culture and the gay nightclub scene in New York. So one of the things she's always been very good at doing is tapping into something that's in the underground and packaging it for consumption and popularity in the mainstream. Her first single to hit the Billboard Top 10 was Borderline. This success would start an impressive streak, the first of 17 Top 10 singles in a row. It was also the beginning of Madonna's influence on fashion. Fans imitated her distinctive style. Fingerless gloves, lace leggings and dresses, layered bracelets and necklaces mixing rosary beads and pearls, all became popular in the early 1980s thanks to Madonna. Madonna is a media phenomenon who has manipulated various media to create a celebrity and a following who really respond to her more on a personal level than on a musical level. Madonna was never shy about acknowledging and using her sexuality in her music and her persona. This attitude fueled groundbreaking work like her performance of Like a Virgin at the 1984 MTV Video Music Awards, but also meant that her career has been peppered with controversy. Her tongue-in-cheek attitude was often lost on the media, who labelled her the material girl after her hit song of the same name. It was meant to be ironic, but no one ever seems to understand my sense of irony, except possibly the French. You know, I love fancy clothes and sparkling diamonds and parties and dressing up and, you know, all of those things, but I don't need them to be happy. By 1991, Madonna had 21 top 10 hits in the United States and had sold more than 70 million albums internationally. She smashed the glass ceiling for women in music. She's the first woman who had complete control over her image and her music. And so she kind of set a tone for and paved the way for other women to similarly mastermind their own careers as popular entertainers. Through the ups and downs of her career, Every controversy or tumultuous relationship from chart-topping music to popular film roles, Madonna has proved to be an unstoppable creative force and a powerhouse of pop music. An emperor who worked to transform Abyssinia into modern Ethiopia. He strove for his country to play a role in global politics, but ultimately outlived his welcome. Haile Selassie stood only five feet four inches tall with a slender build, but he was a charismatic man with a commanding presence. In the early years as Ethiopia's leader, he carried with him the hopes of the nation's youth, championing the modernization of their country, determined to bring Ethiopia to its place among the nations of the world. In 1923, he established his country as a member of the League of Nations. Then Addis Ababa, and on the gateway in French, long live the Emperor Haile Selassie. Peaceful enough today, but what is in store for the capital of the King of Kings? In 1935, Mussolini's troops invaded Ethiopia. Despite Selassie's attempts to modernize his country, they were no match for the military might of Italy. 
Selassie was forced to flee to exile. A series of events that would test the resolve of the League of Nations. Selassie appeared before the assembly in June 1936. So in an unprecedented scene, Haile Selassie stands in dignified silence waiting for the uproar created by Italian journalists to cease. Then, speaking in his native tongue, he makes his dramatic appeal. He was the displaced leader pleading for his country's autonomy against a more powerful aggressor, to a group formed to protect against exactly this situation. This act captivated the world. The League of Nations responded with inaction. This in practice means the recognition that Abyssinia is Italian. A bitter result for Haile Selassie, emperor without a throne. Selassie saw this as a failure to live up to the ideals on which the group was formed. Left to indefinite exile, the fate of his country in the hands of Italy. With the outbreak of World War II, Ethiopia would again be on the right side of global politics. In 1941, Churchill supported Selassie with British troops to take back his country from the Italian occupiers. The triumphal procession to Addis Ababa, led by a British colonel who rode at the head of the forces escorting the Emperor Haile Selassie back to the capital of his empire. Returned to his position in Ethiopia, Selassie continued his efforts to bring Ethiopia into the 20th century. He centralized government, improved social infrastructure, including education, and gave the country its first constitution. But he was not willing to reduce his own power. A widespread famine in 1973 led to over 100,000 deaths and fueled a growing discontent with Selassie's leadership. The following year, he was deposed in a military coup. Haile Selassie was the 225th emperor of Ethiopia and its last. His legacy is tarnished by his inability to curb the suffering of his people through famine and unemployment. Yet he will also be remembered for that moment when he stood in front of the leaders of the world, challenging them to action, so powerfully revealing how ineffectual their systems were at protecting the most vulnerable. Two teenage boys in Ohio would create a character that became an icon of popular culture, enduring through the shifting values of the 20th century. Faster than a speeding bullet, more powerful than a speeding locomotive, leaping buildings in a single bound. It's a bird, it's a plane, it's Superman. High school friends Joe Schuster and Jerry Siegel created Superman when they were 19 years old. The creation of Superman, the Superman that we know and love, first appeared in Action Comics 1 in 1938. But actually, the, the formation of Superman was an ongoing process from 1933 to 1938. And actually, in my view, beyond that, it carried on evolving and, uh, and transforming over the course of many years, even while Siegel and Schuster were, were producing the stories themselves. Siegel and Schuster's character ushered in a period known later as the Golden Age of Comics. This period would last until the downturn in the popularity of superhero comics in the 1950s. Superman would be one of the few characters to survive the change. I think Superman remained successful and popular because he represents a, a core set of values, which I don't think changed very much during the 20th century. Starting with the comics, but expanded to films, TV, cartoons, books, and toys. By the end of the century, there was a multi-million dollar industry built around Superman. Despite this, the pair fought for decades to be credited as creators and for rights and royalties for the lucrative character they created. Their struggle revealed a problem many creators faced, an artist's vulnerability in a climate where art is increasingly commercialized owned by companies rather than creators. The fallout from that has led, in, through the 1970s and 1980s, um, to other comic book creators um, being, being more respected by the publishers, really. They're, they're given royalties, they're given certain rights to their creation. And I, and I think um, Jerry Siegel and Joe Shuster's battle with DC Comics actually helped to, helped to make that change happen. 
Siegel and Schuster created an enduring legacy. More than an action hero, Superman became a figurehead for a genre of stories that were a new mythology, larger-than-life tales exploring concepts of morality and heroism. And I think that's what people look to these days for Superman, is, is, is something to give, give goodness meaning. And I think Superman is a really good emblem uh, of goodness. He, he's wonderful in that respect. The character's presence has risen above any single medium in which he is depicted. Superman is a very important figure in popular culture. Uh, for one reason, I don't think we would have the superhero genre without him. From the imagination of two teenagers came one of the most powerful and enduring fictional characters of the 20th century. A figure who became infamous around the world. The face of an energy crisis that brought the world's greatest superpower to its knees. Revealing the power wielded by those in control of oil. In the early 1970s, the world was increasingly reliant on oil. No country was consuming more than the US. Their own domestic production was dwindling, turning instead to imports from the Middle East. Oil, the world's major source of energy, but finite with diminishing reserves. To the industrialized nations, America and Europe, oil became everything. Enter Ahmed Zaki Yamani, the Saudi Arabian oil minister. He believed the Arab states should exert greater control over their most valuable commodity. A belief that he took to the Arab-dominated Organization of Petroleum Exporting Countries, or OPEC. The first turning point for OPEC came in 1968, when Sheikh Yamani of Saudi Arabia drew up the declaratory statement of petroleum policy of member countries. The philosophy was revolutionary. Ideas learnt on the capitalist-dominated campuses of Harvard and other Western universities. The oil market was on a knife's edge. Then, in October 1973, Egypt and Syria launched a military attack on Israel. In response, the US provided arms and support to Israel. Battle lines were drawn. OPEC met in Tehran in December 1973 deciding to impose a full oil embargo on the US and other countries. Well, we don't like to impose an embargo to start with. We like to use this oil as uh, a means of cooperation. He wasn't the architect of the policy, and he voiced some disapproval of it during the meeting, but he became really the face of the oil crisis for the rest of the world, the hand on the pump, as it were, that was making this decision the stranglehold on oil precipitated energy shortages, power cuts, reduced working hours, economic recession, and inflation. The 1973 oil crisis had begun. In the US, lines formed at gas stations around the country as people scrambled for their rationed supplies. The embargo was lifted in March 1974, only a matter of months after it had started but the shock of how reliant the world was on Arab oil lingered. OPEC countries had been negotiating more control over their oil industries before 1973, but it was the crisis that awakened the true power they held. The man at the center of this maelstrom was Ahmed Zaki Yamani. Let us not think of oil embargo. Let us think of cooperation. Right now we are in the mood for cooperation. I don't think you are in a position to do anything about the energy except with your cooperation with the oil producers. This was the first time that U.S. foreign policy had really come home to roost to the U.S. We haven't lost the connotation of oil as a weapon since then. Every U.S. president since the embargo has talked about energy independence, energy security, from foreign dictators that control supply. With little formal education in physics, he would become a pioneer in communication technology. His work would save lives and connect the world as never before.
To many people, if you ask who invented radio, um, instantaneously the name Marconi comes up. And yet, at the same time, and we have, as with so many inventions, a confluence of many ideas, many little techniques. Guglielmo Marconi began working with the possibilities of wireless communication in the early 1890s. He wasn't alone. Scientists like Nikola Tesla and Alexander Popov were also experimenting in the field. But it was Marconi who, in 1901, after years of short-range tests, made the first wireless radio transmission to cross the Atlantic Ocean, defying the popular belief among mathematicians that the curvature of the Earth would make such a transmission impossible. He combines the work of a lot of other engineers and physicists into a working long-distance wireless telegraphy system, essentially wireless radio, and was able to commercialize it. The shipping industry almost immediately adopted Marconi's technology. A development in broadcasting technology and navigation systems that effectively ended the isolation of ocean travel. Guglielmo Marconi. Can we estimate what the world owes to him, if only in respect of life saved at sea? His famous signal CQD was the first used for distress calls. Just over ten years after Marconi's first radio transmission, a terrible disaster at sea would prove once again the value of his invention. On April 14, 1912, the RMS Titanic hit an iceberg in the early hours of the morning. The two radio broadcasters on the Titanic were actually employees of Marconi, not of the shipping line. They broadcast an SOS, and another ship came to rescue some 700 people. And I think that really crystallized just how important wireless communication really was going to be. Over the next decade, Marconi continued to tinker with the possibilities of radio communication, connecting people around the world. Hello, hello. It is my very great honor to announce to you that His Holiness, Pius XI, will inaugurate the radio station of the state of the Vatican City. Marconi's work in shortwave radio established a system that remains the basis for modern wireless radio communications around the world. It may have been surpassed in some respects, but it still forms an essential part of our lives. It's very easy, I think, to forget just how important radio still is in an emergency, for example. It's not television or the internet or the telephone that we can rely on, it's wireless broadcasting. The 1950s gave rise to the suburban sprawl, a quintessentially American way of life, where the roles in the family were rigidly defined. Where women were bombarded with images of the perfect housewife, her sense of fulfillment found in achieving the high polish on her floors, or that perfect white in her laundry. But as the 50s gave way to the 60s, it was a structure that couldn't last. By the early 1960s, the number of university-educated women was on the rise. One of these women was Betty Friedan. With a degree in psychology and a career as a journalist, she was pregnant with her second child when she was fired. A casualty of the prevailing attitude that married women should give up their careers to make a home for their family. Middle-class suburbs filled with educated women kept out of the workplace isolated in their frustration, their sense of restlessness and their lack of fulfillment. Until in 1963, Betty Friedan published a book that exploded like a bombshell in the minds of women in America and around the world. The book gave a name to the way they felt, revealing an essential secret. Their experience was shared by millions of women. Betty Friedan's idea of the feminine mystique, that was the name she gave to what she called the problem with no name. And in giving a name to it, she expressed something that many women said they'd been feeling but they couldn't quite put their finger on. So for a lot of women it was a kind of light bulb moment. The feminine mystique spent six weeks at the top of the New York Times bestseller list. 
Pradhan became a figurehead of the fight for women's rights in America. The second wave of the women's liberation movement was born. Pradhan campaigned tirelessly for better representation of women in Congress and was a champion for women's rights, including reproductive rights. She helped found the National Organization for Women. The bosses, the pollsters, the analysts are still analyzing in terms of 68 and even in terms of the 1930s, and they don't understand that something new is, is, is happening in America. While Ferdan went on to write many other works, it is the feminine mystique that has resonated most in the public consciousness. We here shall be able to finish that unfinished business of our equality Women finally will move into equal partnership with men of courage and goodwill of this land, old and young. The most important thing that Betty Friedan did in the book is identify an attitude about what was expected of women. And I think that that's the really critical part of what happened in that book is that she was saying women are expected to behave in these ways and there's a kind of disconnect between the expectations and the realities of women's lives. It was a book that woke up the suburbs, a totem for the equal rights movement. It revealed a simple but powerful truth. Those who felt isolated and marginalized were not alone. He was one of the most influential agents of American foreign policy in the 20th century. His intentions noble, his methods questionable. I know all of you will want to hear from the new Secretary of State. Here is a man who has the poise, the strength, the character to serve in this great position, and that he can handle himself under considerable fire. When Henry Kissinger was made National Security Advisor to President Nixon in 1969, the global population was teetering on the brink of disaster. The Cold War was at its peak. Tensions between the superpowers were playing out by proxy in the Middle East and in Vietnam in a war that seemed like it would never end. I think the important thing to understand about Kissinger's view of the Vietnam War was that for him, what mattered about the Vietnam War was not the war itself, but the war in the context of the much larger world of Cold War confrontation between America and the Soviet Union. 1973 was a crucial year for Kissinger. It began with the signing of a ceasefire agreement with North Vietnam in January. We have recognized that there is no purely military solution to this problem. And we hope uh, that North Vietnam will also realize that there is no military solution to this problem. The agreement fulfilled President Nixon's peace with honor strategy designed by Kissinger, involving a combination of heavy bombing in North Vietnam American troop withdrawals and diplomatic overtures, effectively prolonging the end of the war to save America's reputation in the international community. I would give some credit to Kissinger for enunciating and championing a conception of American foreign policy that did put such a uh, premium on, on, frankly, illusion. Uh, the illusion of strength was as, at least as important as the reality of strength. In that same year, Kissinger also made two trips to China to further the new diplomatic relationship he had helped Nixon build. It's impossible to walk past the China achievement in relation to Henry Kissinger in bringing back a strategic reconciliation with China and thereby fundamentally altering the global geostrategic balance against the then Soviet Union. Throughout his career, Kissinger was an incredible force for change in global politics. The United States will never forget. But this came at a terrible price for nations like Cambodia, Chile, and East Timor. Millions of citizens whose freedom and lives were the casualty of his policies. I think anybody who is as dedicated to bare-knuckled rail politic, the, the, the sort of unapologetic and sometimes unprincipled contest between nations, is bound to create a lot of animosity. Henry Kissinger was a pivotal figure in American foreign policy in the early 1970s, but his manipulations and his exclusion of Congress and foreign policy making 
made him a polarizing figure. Unanswered moral questions cast a long shadow over his legacy. I think that Kissinger's probably greatest intellectual achievement was as a theoretician of deterrence, of how do you exercise power in a thermonuclear age. But his willingness to use a variety of means to advance his own point of views and to discredit his critics is something that will attach to his reputation through history. From radio to stage to screen, his was a tumultuous career that was at once inventive and fraught. His work was both notorious and enduring influencing some of the century's most memorable cultural moments. Orson Welles suffered all his life from being uh, regarded as a, a kind of genius in whatever he wanted to do. He was a boy wonder. Orson Welles was in his early 20s when he began directing theatre productions. He drew attention for his innovative storytelling and disregard for popular conventions. In 1936, he directed and produced an adaptation of Macbeth with an entirely African-American cast. The scene was changed from Scotland to Haiti, but the spirit of Macbeth and every line in the play has remained intact. The following year, Wells started his own production company with actor and producer John Houseman. Wells was a seasoned radio performer, so naturally they turned their productions into a radio series. It gained little attention, until they broadcast an adaptation of H.G. Wells' famous science fiction novel, War of the Worlds, on October 30, 1938. Delivered as a real radio broadcast reporting on an alien invasion. Oh yeah, I can see the thing's body now, it's large, it's large as a bear. It glistens like wet leather, but that face, it, it, ladies and gentlemen, it's indescribable, but I can hardly force myself to keep looking at it. What happened next is open to debate. Either the broadcast caused a panic across America, or the frenzy was reserved for newspaper rooms across the country, quick to print headlines about the panic caused by the broadcast. Either way, the result was the same. Orson Welles, at 23 years old, was making national headlines. He handled this new attention with self-assurance and wit. It came rather as a great surprise to us that a story, fine H.G. Wells classic, about a mythical invasion by monsters from the planet Mars should have had so profound an effect upon radio listeners. The media frenzy that surrounded Wells only served to increase his fame and the interest of Hollywood giving him the level of power and success he needed to negotiate a contract with Hollywood studio RKO. In my case, I didn't want money. I wanted authority. So I asked the impossible, hoping to be left alone. And at the end of a year's negotiations, I got it. Under this contract, he wrote, directed, and starred in Citizen Kane in 1941. Wells used the freedom he negotiated to pioneer revolutionary film techniques and storytelling devices. Citizen Kane was a critical success, but failed at the box office. In the years since its release, it has taken on a new life, regularly topping critic and audience lists as the greatest film of all time. At times brash and always confident, Wells was more certain of what he was trying to achieve than others often were of him. No one ever doubted his brilliance, but the people putting up the money very much doubted that he understood what the public wanted. So he was always out of gear with what Hollywood wanted cinema to be, and the result was that his films were not all that widely seen. And it's been a long process of reissuing them and, and indeed using them to teach the filmmakers of today how to make films, because uh, watching Orson Welles' films is like a kind of film school. Orson Welles never directed a film that made a profit in his lifetime. Yet he is responsible for some of the most history-making and innovative storytelling of the 20th century. 1968. In April, the assassination of Martin Luther King Jr. had shocked America and the world. By June, 
a new figure had emerged to rally American hopes, only to be dashed in a single act. A man, a gun, and an assassination that forever changed America. Let us, for God's sake, resolve to live under the law. President Johnson's plea to a nation staggering from the shock of this second Kennedy assassination. The face of evil, Sahan Sahan. On June 5th, 1968, 22-year-old Sahan Sahan arrived at the Ambassador Hotel in Los Angeles carrying a gun. That same night, crowds were gathering at the hotel to hear Robert Kennedy give his victory speech. He had just won the California primary and was on his way to being the Democratic candidate for the next presidential election. Kennedy was a charismatic figure. His optimism, his anti-war stance, and his ability to unite minority groups promised a brighter future. One of Bobby Kennedy's most important contributions was to give to people who weren't getting a fair shake in American life the sense that there was a person who cared and who maybe could even do something about it. Just after midnight, Robert Kennedy left the stage and walked through the hotel kitchen, greeting the staff as he passed. He stepped out into the crowded corridor, accompanied by star athletes Raver Johnson and Roosevelt Greer. Gunshots echoed through the crowd. Johnson and Greer saw Sirhan Sirhan holding a gun, and they tackled him to the ground. But Robert Kennedy had already been shot, along with several bystanders. Family and friends scrambled to help Kennedy, rushing him to hospital. He died of his wounds 26 hours later. It was a terrible blow for the country. It tore people's hearts out. It, it, it made you feel that there was nothing left, that any hope was going to be struck down that the forces of repression were just too powerful. Conspiracy theories swirled around the assassination. The can alerts or the markings of the bullets vary, and therefore the question arises whether or not a bullet from the Sirhan gun did in fact penetrate uh, Senator Kennedy at any time. I'm convinced that another gun besides the one of Sirhan Sirhan must have been in that kitchen. Sirhan has long maintained that he has no recollection of that night. At trial, Sirhan's defense argued that he was brainwashed by an occult religion, that his capacity to stand trial was diminished. Police found papers and journals at Sirhan's home in which he reportedly blamed Kennedy for US involvement in the Six-Day War between Israel and its Arab neighbors. Whether the assassination was politically motivated, the fallout would be felt for years in a lingering sense of what might have been. It's hard to kind of be the, the objective historian sometimes about things that were really emotional moments in your own life. You know, you think, well, what, what if Kennedy had lived? What if he had faced Nixon? It's, the what ifs are always tantalizing. The rise of Robert Kennedy was seen as the last hope for a better America. With his murder, those hopes were dashed. It seemed to say that violence was always going to have a large role in American public life. There's, there's still a raw, a raw nerve there, and violence has continued to play a role uh, in one way or another in American public life and American public discourse. At the center of the sense of chaos and despair wrought by Robert Kennedy's assassination is Sirhan Sirhan, one of the most infamous names of the 20th century. In the next episode, a woman who pioneered the multi-billion dollar cosmetics industry, a man whose actions would bring the summer of love to a horrifying end, and a science fiction author whose influence rippled through the scientific community. <laughs>